Good morning. My name is Wade Sisler and welcome to Story Lab. Thank you for joining us uh, virtually this morning, wherever you are. We are fortunate to have many bright minds at NASA and by extension, many different types of thinkers. Some may think verbally, others spatially, and others still in pictures. Um, how can these diverse thinkers come together to help answer some of the most pressing questions in the universe? Well, after today's presentation, we'll come a step closer to finding out. If this is your first time joining us, Story Lab is a colloquium organized by Goddard's Office of Communications, and it's a chance for us to step outside the gates to hear from an incredible range of storytellers who inspire us. This Story Lab is being recorded and will be available after the show. After the presentation, we'll take a few questions. You can drop those in the chat windows here. Um, and a quick shout out to the team behind today's colloquium. Liz Gerald is one of Story Lab's principal organizers and creative voices. Travis Woolrab directs and engineers this stream. Daryl De La Rosa, Nanette Harris, and Paul Manning publicize and share the event. Today, we're fortunate to be joined by a guest who is truly world-renowned in her field, Dr. Temple Grandin. She's joining us today from her home in Colorado. Temple is a professor of animal science at Colorado State University and one of the world's leading experts in animal behavior. She is also one of the world's leading autism advocates and was one of the first people to document the insight gained from her personal experiences with autism. Her honors are many, including induction to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the National Women's Hall of Fame, and she has been named one of Time Magazine's most influential people. She was the subject of an Emmy and Golden Globe winning film produced by HBO. And, uh, but wait, there's just a little bit more. Temple is also a prolific and best-selling author. Her la latest book, Visual Thinking, is set for an October release. It details the gifts of those who think in pictures, patterns, and abstractions. So without further delay, please join me in welcoming Dr. Ted Grandin. Temple, uh, all Great clapping. to be here today uh, virtually. And I think I wanna talk about how there's different kinds of thinking I'm going to be talking about different types of thinkers. Now, the first step is learning that different types of thinking exist. I think completely in pictures. If you watch the HBO movie about me, it shows exactly how I think in pictures. I thought everybody thought the same way. And we're gonna, what I want to show you in this slide presentation is that different kinds of thinkers bring different kinds of skills to problem solving. Let's go to the next slide. The first step is learning that different people think differently. Next slide. Well, visual thinking really helped me in my animal behavior work because uh, this here's a picture of some <clears throat> shoot where cattle would move through this shoot and you can see my own shadow in there. Sometimes your own shadow can make them balk. Cattle are afraid of a lot of little things that people don't notice. And when I first started doing this research, I thought everybody was visual thinker. Let's go to the next slide. Animals live in a sensory based world. Now, there's different ways of looking at risk. Visual thinkers see risk. Engineers calculate risk. Five years ago, I had a great visit to NASA at Cape Kennedy. It was a really emotional time for me. And I stood and I looked at the vehicle assembly building. I got to go in it and I'm going, we went to the moon. It was the coolest thing we ever did. We're doing more cool things. I got to visit this launch pad five years ago, which your rocket's sitting on right now. And uh, I saw something there. And I saw something in there that nobody else saw. It's on the next slide. I watched him waddle down the steps at seven o'clock in the morning. He was inside there with some equipment in there that I um, wasn't too happy that he's around. And I'm sure he's not in there now, but that's an example of seeing risk. Nobody else saw the raccoon. I just saw a little motion over on the stairway. I watched him go down the stairway and waddle off in the bushes. He was overnighting inside that base. Let's go to the next slide. Now let's look at where we need different kinds of minds to make sure we do scientific research that's gonna be right. Here are two common, really simple little devices for mixing cancer cells, for mixing things in labs. Now, depending on which device you use, it can totally change the results of cancer studies. So when I review journal articles, even though I'm terrible at math, I wanna make sure they put in there, did you use a magnetic stirrer or did you use this uh, little carnival ride here for test tubes? 
it makes a difference. You see, but when I think about these devices, I see them. They're not abstract. Um, uh, these devices here ruined millions of dollars worth of cancer research because one lab used one device, the other lab used another device. Let's go to the next slide. Three types of thinking. Let's go through them. Next slide. Okay, I'm an object visualizer. I'm the one who can't do algebra, absolutely can't do algebra. I don't know how to get through school today, but the kind of stuff I'm good at doing, mechanical equipment. There's a lot of mechanical equipment in the food processing plant. Graphic design, photography, working with animals, highly skilled traits. I worked with a lot of people uh, designing um, cattle handling facilities I designed that just got into it through a welding class. There's kind of two parts of engineering. You've got the degreed engineers, in a food processing plant, they'll do the boilers and refrigeration, but then you got the clever engineering department that invents all the clever equipment. Right, okay, let's go to the next slide. Now the spatial visualizers, these are your STEM type mathematicians. Computer programming, engineering, chemistry, physics, music and math go together. These are your university engineers, but you also need to shop people that are more my kind of mind. Let's go to the next slide. And then how about your word thinkers? Writer, finance, psychologist, lawyer, teacher. And uh, we need the different kinds of minds. For example, when I worked on my new book, I wrote all the rough drafts. And Betsy, my total verbal thinker, she reorganized everything. She did a great job. That's the two different kinds of minds working together. Let's take computer interfaces, you know, like what's Microsoft Teams that we're using. You need my kind of mind to make the interface easy to use. And the mathematicians have to make the programming work. You need both kinds of minds. I was on the phone yesterday with an airline, and uh, here's something I thought was a really bad interface. I go to check in, and then it, it then it says, "Would you like to take an alternate flight?" And then it says, "Got it." I'm going. Ah, if I click on that, am I going to cancel my plane ticket? Uh, no, I didn't think it was a very good interface. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, now this research that shows these different kinds of minds exist, and these are the Kozniakov papers. And there's two types of visualization. There's object visualization, where you think in photorealistic pictures, and then there is the pattern thinker, mathematicians that think in patterns. This research is going to be gone into detail in my book, Visual Thinking. Yes, these different kinds of thinkers really do exist. Let's go to the next slide. Some people have mixtures, but the thing is, when a kid gets a label like autism or dyslexia or something like that, they might be an extreme object visualizer. They'll be a best shop guy. I know shop guys that couldn't do algebra and they were inventing all kinds of equipment, patenting it mechanically, uh, mechanical equipment. Um, or they might be an extreme mathematician. You need those too. I've been looking at all of the, the new uh, web telescope pictures. Oh man, beautiful. Let's go to the next slide. Now, it turns out I got a giant visual thinking circuit in my head. Giant trunk line. Journey to the center of my mind. Show you another picture of that, of the big visual thinking circuit on another slide. It just shows a different slice. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, we can go on to the next slide. All right. Let's look at how people prefer to get information. Okay, let's say I'm trying to read about how something works. It's a study that was done. And one of the examples I used was a toilet uh, float. The object visualizer would rather look at the diagrams of it. The verbal thinker would rather look at the written text. And the visual spatial actually ends up looking at both the diagram and the written text. Let's go to the next slide. Now, another very fascinating study that showed that there's different kinds of minds was they took students from a high school specializing in the arts a high school specializing in science, another high school specializing in humanities. And they asked them to design a planet. And the art students put, you know, made a crystal planet, really fantastic. The science students made it very much simpler and described the atmosphere. And uh, the thing that was interesting is that the visual thinkers and the math thinkers carefully planned out their planets. The verbal thinkers didn't do very much planning. One of the problems you've got with verbal thinkers is they overgeneralize. They'll talk about, let's be inclusive. Let's hire diverse minds. I'm going to be a lot more specific on why we need to be hiring diverse minds. Let's go to the next slide. Verbal thinkers overgeneralize. Very top down. Visual thinkers like me, object visualizers and mathematicians, we're bottom up. 
really into the details. In other words, you take lots of details, you put them together to form concepts. We go to the next slide. Now let's look at some of the early inventors. When I was a child, I had a book about famous inventors. Loved it when I was in about fourth grade. And I read about things like the early, you know, a machine like the grain harvester, the reaper. That's a mechanical device. That was probably invented. He was probably not a mathematician. When I talk about the visual thinking part of engineering, think of some of these early patents. They were all clever mechanical devices. Let's go to the next slide. And uh, first commercial 3D printer. Again, I'm a visual thinker. Let's go to the next slide. The problem is there's a lot of things we've lost skills. We're not making. So I want to ask is, where are the clever engineers? These are the shop people that often don't get enough credit. You know, like the Wright brothers tinkering around. They were bicycle mechanics and they invented the airplane. Let's go to the next slide. All right. Over half of large 3D printers sold to industry are European. In 2019, right before COVID hit, I went to a poultry processing plant, two pork plants, and the Steve Jobs Mothership Building and Theater. And I was shocked to find out that the poultry processing plant came over here in 100 shipping containers from Holland. This goes back to the mistake of taking shop classes out 25 years ago. Also, a lot of the companies closed down in-house engineering departments. Huge mistake. Let's go to the next slide. State-of-the-art electronic chip making machine. It's from Holland. Yeah, it goes back to their educational system. We have a tendency to kind of stick the nose up at the hands-on stuff. Let's go to the next slide. Look at all the mechanical stuff there. You're going to need good shop people working on this. You're going to need those people that can't do algebra. Yes, we need algebra for, okay, the mathematicians got the Mars rover to Mars, but you need my kind of mind to work on building it. Beautiful hand-done wiring on that. I've looked at it. I've got, I found the pictures of the cameras. I mean, they weren't very big. Somebody built those on a workbench. That often doesn't get enough credit. Let's go to the next slide. Newest electron microscope. It's from Germany. Let's go to the next slide. All right, that's a pork processing plant. All the equipment's imported from a high-wage country. Yeah, I'm very concerned about skill loss. Let's go to the next slide. All right. Parachute fabric for the Mars lander. I found the vendor They're from the UK, woven on high-tech looms in Europe. Yes, you, you, you made the parachute here, but the fabric came from Europe. Let's go to the next slide. And here is the Steve Jobs Theater, and I'm screaming in the middle of it, we don't make it anymore. Structural glass walls from Italy and Germany, and a carbon fiber roof from Dubai. And then COVID hit. And so during all the COVID, I worked on my new book. This is my, my lockdown project. And I got together with Betsy, my fabulous verbal thinker. We were great collaborators because we recognized how um, we can use each other's skills. I do the rough draft. She straightens it all out. Let's go to the next slide. Okay. We paid the price for taking these classes out of the schools. Art, sewing playing musical instruments, welding, woodworking, working on cars, theater. This brings up a really important thing about careers. Students get interested in stuff they get exposed to. It's just that simple. Um, a lot of people that I worked with on, on that built my equipment, they grew up working on cars or they took a single welding class and now they have a big company and 20 patents. Let's go to the next slide and they, none of them can do algebra. I absolutely could not do algebra. I don't know how I would get where I was today. 60% of community college students need remedial math. Now, yes, if you're going to go for the math, there is the mathematical side of engineering where you need algebra. You definitely need it. But does a veterinarian need to take calculus? I don't know any veterinarian who actually uses calculus. Yes, you need to use the old-fashioned arithmetic. No, I'm going to show you, you need those people in the shop. Let's go to the next slide. My grandfather was the co-inventor of the autopilot for airplanes. They were tinkerers. He was an MIT trained mathematical engineer. And he worked with another guy that definitely was on the autism spectrum, undiagnosed, who came up with this crazy idea of free little coils. Everybody in aviation goes, uh, uh, stupid. 
Well, they tinkered and they tinkered and they made it work. It was in every warplane during World War II. But the stolen version was. This is where if they'd had a lawyer, a verbal thinker, maybe it wouldn't have gotten stolen. See, what I want to show you, we need all three different types of minds. Let's go to the next slide. Object visualizers. Let's look at who builds food processing plants. My kind of thinker, a one semester drafting class is laying out an entire factory, laying out entire big factories. I worked with these people. Now they degreed engineer. Yep, we need them. boilers, refrigeration, power and water. Make sure the roof doesn't collapse. But then you need my kind of thinker, a to algebra, to make that packaging machine, to make that clever piece of equipment that's mechanically clever. You have a lot of that in food processing and you've got 3D printers, robotics. You know, what people forget is that a 3D printer or a robot is a mechanical device controlled by a computer. Well, Betsy didn't understand that until after she watched a whole bunch of 3D printing videos. Then she understood it. Yes, there's a computer part. That's for the mathematicians. But then the people more like me have to make the tool that goes on the end of the robot's arm. Let's go to the next slide. So in the book, I wrote the first drafts. Betsy straightened them out. You see, we're, we're using the different skills together. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, collaboration on building buildings. Okay, the object visualizers, the creativity, the appearance, the aesthetics, aesthetics. Engineers tend to, mathematically trained engineers, form and functions the same. You know, building designed by an engineer, you know, concrete box. Yep, it's totally functional, but not very pretty. You see, you need both. You need both kinds of minds and recognize the skills that they bring to the table. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, 20% of the people I worked with, and I've designed the front end of every Cargill beef plant in North America, steel and concrete work, mechanical stuff. And the people I worked with grew up working on cars, had a single welding class, own a metal fabrication shop, multiple patents. None of them could do algebra. One of them took a single welding class. He is building things all over the country and has a corporate jet. He can't do algebra. Let's go to the next slide. Now we need the mathematical engineers to do the algebra. You see, this is where we need the teams, but I'm worried my kind of thinker is just getting screened out. Grandparents have come up to me and they discover they're autistic when their kids get diagnosed. And a lot of these had successful careers. I gave a talk at Houston. I talked to maybe three or four retired NASA engineers. They said, oh, half those guys in the control room are probably on the spectrum for the moonshot. Oh, yeah, and I got to sit in the original control room. That was so cool. Oh, man, I get emotional. This is where autistic people have emotions. Oh, I was like crying in front of the vehicle assembly building uh, because uh, that's where we went to the moon. That was five years ago that I was there. Let's go to the next slide. You know, the thing I want to ask you is what would happen to some of our famous innovators, the Wright brothers? What would happen to them today? Would they be addicted to video games? We see all of these kids getting addicted to video games. They're not going into the video game industry. I'll tell you how to get them off the video games. Car mechanics. You know, because they're my kind of mind. And then they find out that um, cars are a lot more interesting than video games. What would happen to Einstein today? No speech until age three. We'll go to the next slide. Michelangelo dropped out of school at age 12. Dirty little brat. But there were two things in his favor. He was running around in all the churches that were commissioning great art. That's exposure. And he grew up with stone cutting tools. So it's exposure, then mentoring. That's how people get into careers. And I had some wonderful mentors. I had a wonderful science teacher. I was a bored student who didn't care. And he gave me interesting projects. And then I got motivated. I turned myself around and studied. Because bad grades in history, that was just goofing off. Let's go to the next slide. Steve Jobs bullied in school. I'm uh, tinkering around in the neighbor's garage. I'm... Um, we have kids growing up today that have never used tools. So how can you get interested in making things if you never use tools? I had a student in my class last year who had never used a ruler to measure anything. We've got people making policy now that growing up totally removed from real things. 
Other places we need these visual thinkers. We've got water systems falling apart in major cities. Let's go to the next slide. Thomas Edison dropped out of school, probably had autism. But one of the things he did is he learned how to work at an early age. And he had mentoring. He had a mentor that taught him how to use the telegraph. Let's go to the next slide. Elon Musk has come out and said that he's on the autism spectrum. Now, I read Ashley Vance's book years ago, and I marked it all up where I thought he was on the autism spectrum. But now I can say it. So I was on a Zoom call last night with teachers out in El Centro, California. And they said, well, the kid's feeling down because he's autistic. I said, you need to tell other people that Einstein and Elon Musk also are autistic, and they had pretty good careers. Let's go to the next slide. Nobel Prize winner was 50% more likely to have an arts and crafts hobby compared to another scientist. That's another reason why we need to be keeping creative classes in the schools. Einstein played the violin. And when he couldn't figure out some of his math, he'd figure it out playing the violin. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so here are some tips for working with minds that are different. Never overload working memory. Don't put this kid on a bunch of multitasking. Now, when I went and visited Kennedy, I saw a whole lot of um, wonderful stuff uh, they were doing in the shops. None of this was multitasking. Uh, tasks that involve sequence, give them a pilot's checklist. I'm seeing too many parents baby these kids. They're just not learning a lot of things. And don't be vague. One of the things where they had to really get after me was on hygiene. You can't be a filthy, dirty, rude slob. No, there's some social niceties. You've got to clean it up. And that was made very clear to me. Let's go to the next slide. What's the ultimate goal of education? Where is a student 10 years later? Yeah, I hope they're working for NASA 10 years later. That'd be great. Let's go to the next slide. Now, how did I get started in my livestock design business? How did I do this? When you're weird, what I did was I showed off my work. When I showed people my hand done drawings, they're going, wow. I learned to sell my work. And I talked to a lot of big corporations. And two things I tell them, and I talked to an airline just the other day, is that if you're hiring airplane mechanics, uh, don't hire them based on their interviewing ability. Look at the car maybe they rebuilt, the classic car they rebuilt. That's where that mechanic could show off his portfolio. That's the kind of person that would be really super good at fixing airplanes. Or the super good programmer. Give them a place where they can show off their coding. Because the social verbal person in HR doesn't know how to evaluate coding. Because one of the things I did is I made sure I showed my drawings to plant managers and engineers that would appreciate my drawings. Let's go to the next slide. And that's the drawing right there I used to sell Cargill. That got sent to Cargill back in the late 1980s, before there was internet. Selling your work. That's what I learned. Sell my work rather than myself. Now, the other thing that works with me is clear projects. I was just on a Zoom call right before I came onto this. We're working on some animal welfare guidelines. And I said, look, let me do this part of the document where I have a little piece of that document. I'll write that. That's where I work best on a team project where I have a well-defined piece of that project that's mine, like the cattle handling system, for example. I don't design the whole plant. I just design the cattle handling system. Let's go to the next slide. There's one of the pictures I sent to Cargill, just showing off my work. We'll go to the next slide. There's another picture. That's the, um, pro the uh, system that they recreated for the movie. I love the HBO movie, Temple Grandin. They show all my projects. Also, that movie shows exactly how I think visually. It shows it. If you want to know how visual thinking works, it shows it. Let's go to the next slide. And there's my brochure, again, making it very professional. We'll go to the next slide. And that's one, another one of the pictures that got sent. We'll go on to the next slide. Well, I also do lots of exercise. Uh, that's an important thing to do. And I think we can just stop there. And we're going to have um, plenty of time to do questions. That's going to be really, really, really good. I always like to do lots of questions. But what I hope I have done is to get you thinking about different ways of looking at the different kinds of minds. You've got the mathematical minds, your, your regular STEM degreed engineer, 
But then you got the visual thinkers like me. We work out in the shop. Most of the people I worked with barely graduated from high school. But they were patenting and selling very complicated mechanical devices. See, there's two parts of engineering. There's what I call the clever engineering department. Let's think those high-tech looms in Europe that wove in the, wove the parachute cloth. That's an example of clever engineering. They're mechanical devices. You see, you need both kinds of minds, and they bring different skills in, into the project. Well, hopefully, we got lots of questions. Well, we, we do. Great. Wonderful. So um, uh, I'm just going to read a few of the questions that are coming okay. in. I'm, I'm going to start off with Jessica says, uh, Dr. Grandin, thank you so much for this presentation. As you look at the stories and videos that we put out as NASA communicators, there are a lot of communicators in this audience yep. today. Um, do you have some thoughts on how we can make our materials more accessible to people with diverse kinds of minds, especially, especially, she says, visual thinkers like yourself. How well do you think we're doing in this area? Well, I'm gonna. Ha I didn't have to be perfectly honest. I didn't go through all the websites to look. You know, some of the stuff is really, really good. I remember reading about a machinist that was working on on a project. I was glad to see that machinist uh, getting recognized because I'm. Um, it takes all kinds of minds, and where I'm the most worried is my kind of thinker. Since I can't do algebra. I don't know how I'd even get through school today. Now, for the mathematical side of engineering, yes, we need algebra. But there's also the non-mathematical side of engineering. And um, I hope Mr. Raccoon has uh, gotten eliminated from the launch pad. And, and when I saw the rocket on the launch pad, that's the same launch pad. So you know what I did? I went and I looked up your pictures. And then I got the ones on my phone to look at the steel work very, very closely. And I go, yeah, it's the same one. As you build two launch pads, the steel work's not going to be exactly the same. Well, as I said, there are a lot of communicators in the audience today. It's been 25 years since you wrote your first best-selling book or maybe uh, the best-selling book. And that is uh, Thinking in Pictures right Thinking here. In pictures. Thinking in Pictures. So on one, my first book. You, you, you address this a little bit in your talk, but I was hoping you could talk a little bit more about your role as an author, since you've, uh, as a visual thinker, how do you approach writing a new book? Well, I, when I write, let's say I just wrote about seeing the launch pad and the raccoon, let's say I wrote about that, I see it, it plays like a video. We were underneath there at seven o'clock in the morning, early, and I saw motion on the stairway. And I looked over there and I saw him waddle down the steps and run off in the bushes. Um, and then we got inside the base and uh, there was equipment in there that I don't really want that was in there that I don't really want a raccoon around. Because now I'm imagining wires that can be chewed and I explained that he will chew the things that um, people have handled. So let's say you leave an electrical board open. Well, if it's turned off electrical board, he'll just wreck your wiring. If it's turned on, it probably get fried. But. Um, then I, I imagine the things he'll chew, tool handles because they've been handled. Uh, maybe he'll crap in something that would be bad. Um, it's uh, what I when I write, the, uh, the writing narrates the pictures in my head. Now, one of the things that that causes a problem is, is organization. A visual thinker will tend to ramble. And so to prevent rambling, like if I'm writing a scientific article, I, I like scientific article as an outline. You have an abstract, intro different parts of your method section, results, and then discussion. But to prevent rambling, I have to make outlines. So I would do a first draft, and then Betsy would do her magic on it, saying, well, maybe this part here ought to be the beginning of the chapter. I always wrote the first drafts, and then Betsy would um, reorganize them, and then she'd add some things, and then I'd say, okay, Betsy, you took out too much detail, because the verbal thinker tends to remove too much detail. They'll talk about, we need to hire diverse minds. I'm trying to give you much more specific examples of where you, where you need different types of minds. But you see, I see it. I'm seeing people right, I worked with in these different shops. I'm seeing them. It's like video clips. So when I first went to a big meat factory, and it was really complicated, I remember looking at it and going, this is so complicated. How does the plant manager understand it? But after kind of doing my self-made internship for three years, Okay, what's uh, I don't know, something's starting to download here. Wait a minute, why is it saying I should sign in? So we're not going to have a system crash here. 
We can still hear you. You're okay, sound great. Okay. I just uh, don't like it when things start opening up on the screen. Um, and, and then I might get a router crash. Then you got to exit fast because it takes me half an hour to fix the router if it crashes. Okay. So now I kind of got off the subject. See, a visual well, thinker, you know, rambles. And, and that's where I need Betsy to straighten that out. But the verbal thinker takes out too much detail. See, I've given you specific examples of diverse minds working together. I don't talk about it in the top-down abstract. You see, I'm a bottom-up thinker. But for a bottom-up thinker to be effective, I have to have a lot of data. You've got to fill the Google that's inside my head with information. Then I can search it. Um, and, uh, and and let me just give a plug. I'm glad to hear you like uh, the, the you love the HBO movie. I, I watched just a few days ago, and I I, I will give a plug for that. Um, and, and it does talk a lot about your your visual thinking. Uh, uh, let's let's get down. Let's drill down just a little bit uh, more on that. Uh, okay. Liz asked, um, do you have an estimate on what percentage of verbal versus visual versus spatial thinkers there may be in the world? Well, that's hard. I th I'm going to just say that probably, you know, a third of each oh. kind. And I, what the other thing is, most so-called normal people are mixtures. They tend to be mixtures. Where do you get the extreme visualizer or the extreme mathematician, your top physicist? is the, the autistic ones, the dyslexic ones. When I went and visited uh, Kate Kennedy five years ago, I talked to a very brilliant dyslexic mathematician. I talked to a brilliant construction person who had Tourette syndrome. And um, then I found his eye wiggle. He pretty much um, suppressed it. So that's two special ed kids right there that I saw there five years ago working on the, the, well, working on the projects that you're trying, launching right now. It's, and now I see it. I'm seeing the one guy, we, he'd stepped out the door of a meeting room and he was telling me about his dyslexia and how much trouble he had in school. And he's somebody that was working at, Nat, at Cape Kennedy five years ago when I was there. Um, you see, my, my mind takes specific examples and puts them into categories. Um, but what I'm worried about today is that all, most of the people I worked with, most of the most brilliant ones, they're playing video games in the basement um, with an autism diagnosis. Now, a lot of really good engineers, you've got plenty of them at NASA that are probably autistic. Well, they get emotional about their projects. You see, I have emotions. I geek out over, okay, like when SpaceX took the first manned mission there, I watched the whole three and a half hour feed of the docking. I watched the whole entire thing and geeking out on it. That's, and you know what? I would have gone into aerospace but I had to drop um, physics class. I had to drop an engineering class. And, and the thing that's interesting is I'm finding out that these shop guys that invent mechanically complex equipment, none of them can do algebra. Because I've, I've questioned it. But we need these minds working together. And then in 2019, I went to those four places, two pork plants, a poultry, and the Steve Jobs Theater. And the stuff was imported. I'm going, whoa. i uh, it, we're paying for taking those shop classes out. We're paying for shutting down in-house engineering departments, which was done 20, 25 years ago, at least in my industry. We are paying for that. And I know the car industry is going to pay for that, too. Well, let's talk about a specific example, I, and I've heard you mention. Uh, safety, of course, is a cornerstone of mission success here at NASA. Uh, I've heard you say that Fukushima disaster was a visual thinking mistake. So my question is, why and what can le NASA learn from Fukushima? Well, when I found out what happened, I'm going, you've got to be kidding. You didn't have watertight doors. The basement flooded and the emergency cooling pump electric motor doesn't run too well under water watertight doors would have never happened engineers calculate risk visual thinkers see it how could you not have watertight doors that's just an example of the mathematical mind doesn't see it now i can't design a nuclear reactor but all i know is when you shove the control rods in it almost turns it off it doesn't completely turn it off that's why you have to have the emergency cooling pump and right now i've been watching ukraine I and mean, if they cut all the power to that station, they better have they better put nice quality diesel into those generators. Don't put crappy diesel in it because they're going to have to run those pumps. Um, and then I'm saying, how did they get the diesel in there if they 
busted all the wires that give power to the station. See, that's something that I see it. And when you think about that visually, it's very simple. I can't design a nuclear reactor, but maybe I'm the one who should work on the safety systems. Well, that's fascinating. Uh, let's go to the next question. Uh, Jake Richmond says, uh, Dr. Grandin, I'd love to hear more about that drawing uh, from your portfolio. Can you explain it to those of us who have not seen the HBO movie? Well, when I, okay, let's take something where it shows my visual thinking. And there's a scene in the HBO movie where the word shoe is said. And then it comes up with a whole bunch of almost like fast PowerPoint slides of different types of shoes. Or the word horse is said, and it shows different horses. One of them's on a weather vane. You see, all right, let's, um, I, I, one of the ways I found out that most people weren't visual thinkers, uh, and it was a real shock to me, was I was at an autism meeting, and I found if I ask people to think about their own dog, they'll see it. Something they're that familiar with. But if I ask people something they don't own, this is where I just found out they didn't think the way I did. And the question that really worked was this. Access your memory on church steeples. How do they come into your mind? I always would ask it the same way. <clears throat> the visual thinker starts naming off the churches. They are specific. They see them. They come up like PowerPoint slides. I was shocked when a speech therapist just said this pointy thing. Two lines. That's all she saw. And I was shocked. That's when I realized that other people weren't done, weren't visual thinkers. It, 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 and then I kind, and then in the autistic brain book, I kind of started figuring out this is other type pattern thinker. And, but then when I was researching the autistic brain, I was at three o'clock in the morning, couldn't sleep. Sometimes I couldn't sleep, so I was surfing journal articles, and for some reason, I looked at the reference list of a rather boring. Um, article and I found the Kostnikov papers and they're like they're old they're 2005 why wasn't I finding them you know why I wasn't finding them because I didn't have the magic word object visualizer find those papers you have to type object visualizer into Google otherwise you won't find them I didn't know that search term and then I found a whole lot of papers and then um, and some of those are in the autistic brain but then in this book I got gobs more papers showing that there's different kinds of thinking. And a lot of people are mixtures, but usually one kind of mind kind of thing dominates. You know, like your STEM mathematical engineer, and he's going to be the pattern thinker, mathematics, music, patterns. And the kid, when he's in school, will just look at a math problem and can solve it in his head. And then the verbal thinking teacher wants to have him do it more verbally, step by step. That just frustrates little math geniuses. You shouldn't do that to little math geniuses. Let them do it in their head and move them ahead into harder math. Maybe they need algebra in the third grade. Then let them do it. You see, and I'm seeing parent after parent after parent. Just the other day in Fort Collins, I was at a meeting and a mom was telling me that her son was getting totally frustrated. He was like in third grade because the teacher wants him to do the math sequentially. That's not how math geniuses think. No, let them do it in their head. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. Um, here's a kind of a, a comment and a little question. Uh, Gary says, Temple, you have been my hero for years. How do you overcome fear? Well, I used to be terrified of flying because I was in a very scary emergency landing when I was a senior in high school. What I had to do is make it interesting. And I got to ride in the cockpit of a large airplane, an old constellation, hauling dairy heifers. I had to make it interesting. Interesting makes things less scary. Um, and then another big problem for a lot of people on the spectrum is um, anxiety. Now, in my book, Thinking in Pictures, and this will not be in the new book, in my book, Thinking in Pictures, I discuss my experiences with antidepressant medication. I've been on it for 40 years because in my late in my late 20s, my health was deteriorating because my fear system was cranked up on overdrive, tearing my body apart with colitis. I went on a low dose of an antidepressant. Colitis cleared up in about two weeks. And 
this constant anxiety was a defect in my nervous system that was making my fear system go on overdrive. Oh, antidepressants saved me. I've been on the same med, an old-fashioned one, taking a very, very low dose. We're now on the third vendor of generics on it. I Google Earth, one of the factories to commune with it, to say, please keep making it. Um, but there's some people where a very low dose of something like Prozac, and it needs to be a low dose. Too high a dose will cause agitation and insomnia. It saved me. I've been on it 40 years. The only side effect is I have to drink a lot of water. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, EB says, Dr. Grandin, growing up, I had an illness which damaged my audio processing. I learned to think and remember things by visualizing them and always uh, remember to things as objects. This trips me up when I'm trying to write scientific papers uh, because I see literally dozens of different ways to write the paper. So the, here's the question. Do you have any suggestions on how to prune those different ways to write a paper? Well, one so, of the things uh, that helped me is to make an outline and to prevent the rambling. Maybe only have for each different subheading in your outline. You don't necessarily have to put those subheadings into the finished paper. But I'd recommend making a really tight outline where no more than maybe a half page of uh, double spaced typing with each header to force you not to ramble. That's one of the things that helps me. Otherwise, I do ramble. Because the thinking is associative. My thinking is not linear. It's associative. Okay, now let's go back to the stirring devices in the lab. Well, now my mind can get off on other equipment in the lab. The horrible fume hood I used in graduate school that absolutely did not work. Okay, you see, that's associative thinking. Because that's something I used in a lab. Dreadful fume hood. It was worthless. Thank you. Um, Jake uh, would like to hear a little bit more about uh, uh, your uh, work with animals. And what he says specifically, what are some of the most surprising moments in your experience communicating with animals? Well, animal, the first thing to understand an animal, you have to get away from verbal thinking. They are sensory based, sensory based. What is a dog smelling? What is a dog hearing? What is the dog feeling? And of course, dogs have smelling abilities that, you know, 20 times better than what we have. It's a sensory based world. So the first thing you have to get away from language. And this goes back to where I looked at what cattle were looking at. And and I have a slide that I show of an animal looking at a sunbeam, but it says non-slip flooring on it. I find if I show that slide to little kids, half the class notices that the cattle, the animal is looking at sunbeam. Most of the grown-ups don't notice, especially if they're word-based thinkers. It's uh, realizing it lives in a sensory-based world. There's an interesting book called An Immense World About Animal Senses. I discuss this also in my book, Animals in Translation. It's sensory-based, not word-based. They don't live in a word-based world. That's the, the thing to understand. And I think for some verbal thinkers, it's hard to imagine thought without words. That's easy for me because when I designed equipment, I would see it and I'd start to draw the drawing and, and then I'd you know build it in my mind. Now, in order to do that, I had to have been on construction projects so that all different building things would now be in the database. I don't know, I'm thinking you got to fill the database. You got to fill it. Uh, so, uh, thank you for that. Uh, so Carl asked, um, uh, what do we do for people who have never had a shop class or in in schools that they their shop classes aren't working or they've de-emphasized them? What's your recommendations for today's students who may not be, uh, well, you know, may not have optimal it, learning environments? Okay, there's two kinds of things where I, what do I do with them when they've grown up? If it's on um, children, your own children, let's introduce tools. Because I'm seeing a lot of kids where he's 16 years old and building elaborate things with Legos and never used a tool, introduce them at home. Um, the, it's important to be doing these things. I was using tools in second grade and I was taught safety with tools. And um, this is why I did another book on uh, Calling All Minds because this is my little childhood parachute and kite projects where I'd spend hours tinkering with a little paper kite to make it fly. Um, 
let's just uh, get kids working on things like that. Now, if it's a um, a grown up person, um, you know, the, you see that's the, see what my kind of mind tends to get uh, addicted to video games. I'll tell you how to get the young adults off the video games: car mechanics. It works. It's the one thing that really works. Because then they find out those mechanical devices are more interesting. Um, and, you know, my kind of mind's the worst video game addicts. Now, I'm sure the video game industry doesn't like me very much. If those people were getting wonderful, high-paying jobs in the video game industry, I would not criticize it. But that's not what's happening. Another big problem is parents baby these kids. Okay, they get locked into the label. And the kid's not learning shopping, bank account, laundry, just basic skills. They're not learning enough of that. Because a lot of these shop people I worked with, they grew up working with tools. They took a shop class. They get a welder on the back of a truck, start a little teeny weeny weeny shop. I've been in the cattle industry for 50 years. I saw these tiny little weeny shops form, turn into giant businesses with corporate jet. I watched the guy do it. And... And now the kid's in the basement. And you know what's happening? Those shops are not forming. We've got factories that can't find people to fix stuff. Now, in Nebraska, you can still find it. But you get outside of Nebraska, outside of that heart of that farm country. I got a plant out in California. They got no in-house capability to, build, to fix anything in that plant. And their Thank shop, you. when I take one look at their shop, they don't even have the equipment in there for doing it. And, and we're paying for that now. And One of my favorite uh, a poultry processing plant and hundred shipping containers. Now the buildings made here, boilers, refrigeration, most of that's made here, but not all what I'm going to call the clever engineering equipment. One of my favorite moments in the uh, HBO film uh, was uh, was your relationship with your mentor um, and, or your teacher mentor. Science and could you talk? Who was a NASA space scientist? Could you talk a little bit more about the role of mentors? In, oh, in mentors are so important. I had great teachers when I was young. I had two good mentors in high school, and I was bullied and teased. It was Anne out at the ranch, and that's where I got introduced to the cattle industry. She was a wonderful mentor when I was feeling down, really down. Then there was Mr. Carlock, my science teacher, and what he did is he gave me interesting projects to do. And one of the projects I worked on was developing that Ames distorted room. And they weren't going to tell me how to make that optical illusion. They wanted me to figure it out for myself. And then what he did is he showed me how studying is a pathway to a goal. Now, one of the mistakes he did is pounded away on algebra, and that was useless. But the other other um, other work was um, uh, English and history. I was goofing off. I was a good reader. Didn't read until eight years of age. Mother taught me with phonics. But a mentor is really important. Then to get my business started, a small contractor named Jim Ool saw my drawings and he, he seeked me out to design jobs for him. Little tiny company, had like two employees. He was another important mentor and he was Marine Corps captain. I can tell you, ex-military, they were some of my best mentors. Kind of no nonsense, he was ex-military. The plant superintendent at the Swift plant where I made my self-made internship. He was ex-military officer. Um, I, he showed me how to get my business started. You know, mentors are so important because when you look at careers for everybody, exposure, then mentoring. If you don't get exposed to something, how can you find out whether you love it or hate it? I'm not saying every kid should take shop class, but, it's, but they should have an opportunity to try it. And, and there was a tendency to say, well, the stupid kids take shop. Let me tell you, it's a different kind of intelligence. I've worked with too many shop guys, and they're underestimated on what they do. Thank you. Um, we've got a question here from DK who says, uh, who asks, um, does your brain translate words to images when you read? Yes. Yes. My brain will, um, like if I'm reading a science fiction book and it describes a fantastic planet, I can create a movie in my head of that planet. Now, where I kind of books I don't like are detective novels with lots of different things switching around. Can't keep track of the plot. I like much more straightforward books that, you know, you describes a foreign country or it describes um, a fantastic planet. And that becomes like a movie. Well, Temple, I... 
I think that uh, we've reached the end of our questions. Uh, we want to thank you so much for joining us uh, today and sharing uh, sharing uh, your insights. Uh, it's just so inspiring to us. Uh, uh, we, we look forward to uh, checking out your new book when it comes out next month. Um, uh, I, I don't know if you have any other final words to uh, well, share with I wanna, the group. Uh, what I want to show in my TED talk that I did in 2010, I said the world needs all kinds of minds. And and we need the different kinds of thinkers. And right now, our educational system tends to really favor the verbal thinkers and and the more traditional math thinkers. But we I, we need all the different types of minds because they bring different skill sets. And like my grandfather, for example, we had a we had an autistic guy, an MIT trained mathematical engineer, tinkering in a loft in Springfield, Massachusetts, over where they fix trains. This was not a fancy place. And then the invention was stolen. And my grandfather did not sue because he thought it'd be unpatriotic to sue. If they'd had a lawyer, it wouldn't have been stolen. You see, that's just, and that's a verbal thinker. That's, that's, but then on the other hand, the verbal thinkers are taking over now. I got in a really stupid bureaucratic thing. I was talking to a guy that um, advises on stock investing and stuff like that. They're not supposed to give tax advice. So he writes on this spreadsheet, miscellaneous expenses. And they said, well, we're not allowed to give tax advice. So I just marked taxes. Well, that's some kind of bureaucratic nonsense to get around a rule. Uh, this is just, there's too much of that. When the verbal thinkers take over too much, everything just turns into bureaucratic inertia. Administratium, the heaviest element known to science. Administratium. <laughs> And uh, it's got an atomic weight that's astronomical, and it reacts with absolutely nothing because it's inert. Yes, we need verbal thinkers, but when they totally take over, that's what happens. And I couldn't believe this stupid thing, and I marked the spreadsheet, taxes, tax expenses. <laughs> he says, you marked it. I'm not allowed to say that. That's what Well, I, I was hoping you would. Uh... <laughs> no, it, it, but that's, that's like silliness. Well, I, I was really things done. We need my let's look at things that are falling apart. Water systems, water distribution systems, electric power lines falling down because they're not maintained because of 59 cent hook that was made in 1921. Uh, they didn't replace it that held an insulator to a tower. You see, that's the sort of thing when I'm going, OK, the wind blows at 45 miles an hour and you have to turn off the power because the wires might fall off the big transmission towers. And I can just visualize how that broke. Now, after the book got printed, I got an article that described how these connectors broke. And they broke exactly like I visualized that they would break. And so, of course, I took out the article and I kept it. It's called The Failure of a Century-Old Hook. <laughs> got it right here. This is, I got that just a few weeks ago after the book already was printed, but those things were breaking just exactly the way I predicted it. Yeah, they should have replaced those hooks. Well, th thank you again for sharing that. I, I'm, I am so uh, pleased also that uh, I hope we can borrow your administratium uh, uh, joke oh, uh, for, for use. Around joke. I can't take credit for that. You know where I first learned about that? 25 years ago, the provost at CSU, this is back when it was fax machines. This thing must have been through 10 fax machines because it was all spotty. And he put that on all the faculty's doors. And I've looked it up online. I did not make that up. I can't take credit for that. But, um, you know, that talked about how it breaks into all kinds of subcommittees and <laughs> reacts with absolutely nothing because it's inert. I still have that on my file cabinet at school, stamped with the official provost seal. And that's where I originally got that. And it's old, old, old. It's at least 20 years old. Well, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's still true today. Well, again, I really want, I know you've got a, uh, another call coming up uh, about your book. So I want to get you um, uh, off this call. But uh, thank you so much for sharing your story with us today. It was so inspiring. And uh, and and uh, and you know, uh, love to stay in contact with you. Uh, oh, thanks no, so much. If people want to write to me, 
you know, I, I, if somebody wants to call me, you've got my cell phone number. Uh, you can give that out. Um, and well, I want you, we need these people. And okay. we need all the different kinds of minds. And I don't think a, a, a lot of people realize this. The other thing about the autistic mind, let's say you have an autistic person that's running the waterworks for a city. He loves that waterworks. That's where his emotions are. You want somebody who loves the waterworks. So it will work. Now, when I think about this, I'm starting to cry now. This is where I start to cry because the autistic mind, if he's in charge of that waterworks, that water pumping station and all that equipment is the most important thing in his life. You need that. We have too much of this kind of infrastructure failing right now. Uh, it's a big problem. You like electricity, don't you? Maybe the stuff's got to be maintained. Yeah, it's it's um, and the and you see for me, there's some things emotionally with people I'm missing, but I've got an interesting career. And this is why it's so important for these people to get good careers. You need these people. You need them and you need them badly. Yeah, yes, we do. And uh, and we appreciate we really, really appreciate you sharing your time with us today. Um, and with that, I think we're going to go ahead and uh, call the story lab I'm to a close. To, okay, well, I'm going to leave the meeting. And it was wonderful being here. And thank you so much for having me. And the world really does need all the different kinds of minds collaborating together. Thank you so much. Thanks, Temple. Bye.